Would you please stand for the reading of the gospel for today? This is our sermon text, and it comes from Matthew's gospel, the 25th chapter, beginning in verse 14. Matthew 25, 14. If you'd like to follow along in the Pew Bible, that will begin on page 28 in the Newer Testament. But actually, I'd like for you to listen rather than to read along. Please listen to the word of the Lord. For it is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents. To another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You've been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You've been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward saying, Master, I, 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 knew, I knew you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, you wicked and lazy slave. You knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the good news of our Lord Jesus Messiah, that the church hear what the Spirit is saying. Please pray with me. Gracious God, speak to us in these moments. Show us your mercy. Show us your love. Touch us in ways that we, we can't even expect. Change us. Fill us with your power, we pray. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Please be seated. First things first. I know what you're thinking, so stop. <laughs> you're thinking, oh, look, here it is. Coming up to Stewardship Sunday, we all got letters about stewardship today. And here, we, here we have the same old parable of the talents, and it's going to be another stewardship sermon. Well, it isn't, because this text has nothing to do with stewardship, and we have to understand that to begin. You have heard, I have no doubt, 
If you've been around churches for any time, you've heard multiple sermons on this, and they're all sort of variations on the same theme, I'm quite sure, because I've preached them that way. It's all about using our gifts for God and being good stewards of the talents that we have, our abilities. And the problem is, of course, and you've heard me say this if you've been around for the last few months, you've heard me say this several times when we when come to the parables in Matthew's Gospel. The problem is we, we interpret this, this, this parable as an allegory. And it isn't an allegory. We, you know an allegory in which a story has meaning beyond what is apparent in the story. And each element of a story then has some other symbolic meaning. Uh, probably the greatest example of allegory is John Bunyan's uh, extended allegory, The Pilgrim's Progress. Everybody's name means something. Everybody's actions mean something in that allegory. And we want, we, oh boy, we so want this parable to be an allegory. And we want it so dearly that we simply ignore the parts we don't like. We want it to be an allegory. So we elide those pieces that don't really fit. And we twist the story to make it be what we want it to be. You all know this allegory. You could preach that sermon. You've all heard it so many times. The man represents God. The man represents God, and God bestows on three slaves, not friends, not relatives, but on three slaves, different amounts of money, which we interpret as talents, abilities. And in fact, that's where English gets the word talent. It's from this amount of money. But we don't even know what kind of an amount of money it is, except it's large. Because talent was actually a measurement of mass. It was the amount of water that fit into a particular which size jug. That's what a talent was. And so that by interpretation then, a talent of gold would be the amount of gold you could get into that same volume. We don't know how much it was, and it doesn't really matter for the story. Except that it's a, just a fabulous amount of money. Even one talent is a huge amount of money. So when this master, who is a harsh man, when the master gives the one slave five talents, it's, it's a fortune beyond belief. And when he gives the second one, Two talents is still a considerable amount of money. And even the one talent is more than most people in Jesus' day would ever expect to see in their lifetimes. And the master goes away. And these slaves invest the money as they see fit. Because they've been given the money according to their abilities, right? So the one slave takes the five talents and deals with it and invests it and gets a return of five talents. And the one two does the same with two and returns two talents. And the third slave, who is called wicked, lazy, and worthless, buries his talents, his ability in the ground. And when the master returns, the master heaps praise on the first two and berates the third and takes away the little talent that he has and throws him out into the outer darkness. Is that a picture of God you're comfortable with? I'm not. I'm not. And Jesus never says anywhere that this, 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 this man, this harsh man, is, uh, stands for God in the story. He simply begins the story by saying there was a man. I think we should take him at his word. So we have to get rid of that idea. Okay? We have, to, we have to put out of our minds to the best of our abilities our idea that this is an allegory. Another problem that we have with this text <clears throat> is that the 
because of the chapter and verse divisions that we have, we think of these, these texts as rather discrete pieces. And we don't look at them in their context. And if we look at this, this particular story within its context, I think we get a very different picture. So let's get rid of those ideas, just for a few minutes, if you can. Get rid of those ideas about this being an allegory. Forget what you've heard about this text before. Try to hear it today as if for the first time. That's why I ask you not to read along. So you would listen to the story. Because I think all the clues are there for how we should interpret it. After we're done, if you want to think of it the way in which you are used, I won't stop you. You can go back to that. But I think there's more there for us to glean. So look at the story again. There is a man. He is wealthy and he is harsh. This so-called worthless slave says, I knew you were a harsh man. That you reap where you do not sow, that you gather where you do not scatter seed. This harsh, wealthy man is a thief. Okay? He takes what is not his. That's what we would call somebody who takes in this way. This man is a thief, but he's a good man of business. Kind of like Ebenezer Scrooge and Jacob Marley. It's just keep popping through my head as I've been studying this this week. He was always a good man of business. Uh, he was. He had made himself a fortune. And this harsh man is going away on a journey of undetermined length. And he gives to three of his slaves different amounts of money according to their abilities to handle the money. And the master goes away, and the slaves do what they think is the best thing. Two of these slaves, apparently ones whose business acumen the, the wealthy man appreciated, invested wisely. They got a fabulous return. If we could only get that kind of return on investments today, put your money in a bank and get oh, a nickel a, a year, you know, in interest. It's just these guys, they took risks and they, they ventured out and they invested this money and they made fabulous amounts of money. Again, not their own, understand. They didn't get to keep the money. It's another example of this harsh man reaping where he has not sown. And then the master comes back and, and says to these, these, these two slaves, well done, good and faithful servants. Now that's, tell me, what do you think that is? It's a picture of the world. It's a picture of the way the world is. That's the way money's, money works. It's the way that economies work. And Jesus is not holding this up as an example of, of, of wisdom and, and, and good stewardship. He's saying this is the way the world is. He's talking to his disciples, understand He's speaking to his disciples. And he's telling them what they already know because they are, most of them, peasants. They know that this is the way the world works. They know that those who have get more. They know the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. They know that. That's their world. And Jesus is not saying it's a good thing. He's just saying this is the way it is in the world. And these two smart business people, these two faithful, trustworthy slaves, do what business people do. The third, the so-called wicked, lazy, 
worthless slave knows who his master is, knows what kind of a man his master is, and so rather than risk losing this huge fortune that he has in his hands, this, this one talent, he buries it in the ground when the master comes back. He gives it back to him and he says, here you go. Every penny you gave me. And the master is furious and I have to wonder why. If he gave these investments according to the ability of the slaves, what did he expect? Did he expect this slave to somehow to transcend himself and go out and do something out of character? Did he expect this slave to, to get beyond his, his own ways of thinking and, and, and do something unexpected? I, I don't know what he expected of this guy. But the master does admit, I am that harsh man. I am exactly who you think I am. I, I reap where I do not sow, and I gather where I do not scatter seeds. So you idiot, what did you do? You didn't do, you didn't do any, me any favors. You didn't do me any good. You didn't do yourself any good. Take that money away from him and give it to the one who knows what to do with it. And then throw this worthless slave into the outer darkness. Now, you've heard that phrase, the outer darkness, before recently. And it's in the parable of the wedding banquet. Where a, 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 a peasant comes to the wedding banquet after the invited guests refuse to come. The peasant comes to the wedding banquet, but he doesn't have on a wedding suit. He doesn't have on proper attire. And it makes the, the, the master of the banquet furious. And so he says, take this fool and throw him into the outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. And my point, what I said in that sermon, was that that person, that third person, was actually the one who was faithful. He's the one who stood up against the principalities and the powers. He was the one who represented Jesus' audience. And, and maybe even represented Jesus himself, if we want to continue an allegorical kind of thinking. In the same way, far from being lazy and wicked and worthless, the third slave is the one who upholds the values of the vision of God. He stands even in fear, you understand, even though he knows what's going to come, he stands against the powers in his life. He stands for Jesus' audience. He stands for the disciples. The peasants, the one who know what it's like to be on the bottom of the society, to be on the bottom of the culture. The ones who know what it's like to be the oppressed. The ones who know what it's like to watch the rich get richer. That's what the third servant stands for. Far from being wicked, worthless, and lazy, this servant is faithful to the vision. Even when it costs him. Look at the context. Look at the wider context. Jesus, for, for in a couple of chapters in Matthew's Gospel, has been talking about the eschaton, the end time. And he's telling his disciples to be ready over and over and over again. And it's, it's what's really important is I think that this particular text is actually setting the stage for the one to follow. The story, not parable, but the story of the sheep and the goats. 
but we'll get to that next week. In this text, the faithful servant is the one who stands firm, even at the cost of his little status and station in life. Even as a slave, the empire cared for him. He was not free. He couldn't do as he pleased, but he got, he got his meals. He got clothing and shelter. By standing as a faithful servant of God, he gets the outer darkness. And Jesus is telling, I believe, I, oh my heart, I believe, Jesus is telling his disciples, be ready. Watch, wait, stand. That's not an easy story to hear. I mean, look at this story. It is, it's just, it's vicious. This master who is a thief rewards greed and punishes faithfulness. That's the world. That's what Jesus is telling his disciples. That's the world. So stand and be ready. Stand. Show the world what it means to be a follower. Show the world what it means to be participating in the vision. Because this is sometimes what happens to followers of Jesus. They stand against the world not with violence or anger, but with faith in the call and the grace of God. The third sermon isn't worthless. He is a human being loved of God, and his stand is the stand of God's faith. So the questions that we have to face today, the questions we have to ask ourselves are these, or at least some of them. Are we willing to stand with Jesus against the principalities, principalities and powers of man? <coughs> Are we willing to look for the movement of God on behalf of the poor and the oppressed? Are we willing to be faithful servants of Jesus Messiah, even if it means losing status in the world's eyes? That's what this story is about. Being ready and standing as faithful servants. Now, it's probably a stretch for some of you, and you're going, now, yeah. once again, the pastor's off his nut. He has no idea what he's talking about. Maybe I don't. Maybe I don't. But please do not think of this from an allegory, because it says things about God that I would just rather not be said. I don't think God is a harsh God. I don't think God throws people into the outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. I don't think God takes away from the poor and gives to the rich. I, I, that's how we see. That's how we twist the story to make it what we want it to be. Please don't do that. You don't have to accept what I say. <laughs> I have to know you don't have to accept it, but please. Be honest with the story. Here's the call then. To go as faithful servants. To go and be the people of God in a world that stands against us. To go and be faithful people of the vision. Stand, brothers and sisters, friends, neighbors. Stand with the good news. Stand for the good news. And know this. Wherever we go, whatever we do, God stands with us. Not in a triumphal sense, but in grace and in love and in mercy. Go, good and faithful servants, share in the joy of your true master. Let us pray.
God, show us your way. Show us your will. We are so weak. We are so short-sighted. But we know that you love us. We know that you love all people. We know that you love your creation. Teach us to follow you, to see with your eyes. We pray in the name of the one who gives us the vision. Even Jesus, Messiah, our Lord. Amen.